Located a mere 20 minutes train journey from Leicester City sits Barrow upon Soar, a place of incredible heritage. Not only does the River Soar, fabled to contain the desecrated skeleton of Richard III, run through the village, but there is something else here too. Something much, much older than Richard III, or even Barrow upon Soar itself. The Barrow Kipper. The Barrow Kipper is possibly the most well-known resident in the history of the village, but what do we really know about it? The 160 years following its discovery have been dogged with confusion, disagreements and reclassifications. Over the course of this documentary, we intend to find out exactly what the Barrow Kipper was and how it has affected the village from which it earned its name. One of the biggest success stories to come from Barrow upon Soar is its history with lime, a relationship dating back over a thousand years. As an area rich in such useful material, the village had 11 operational lime quarries, or delts as they are locally known, in the mid-1800s alone. In fact, there was one located right here on Strandcliffe Lane, made visible by this noticeable dip. It was in 1851, whilst digging a pit just outside of the village, similar to the one here, that the workers made a startling discovery. The near-complete fossilised remains of a prehistoric marine reptile which swam around Barrow upon Soar millions of years ago. Its discovery certainly caused a stir, and before long, the creature had a nickname, the Barrow Kipper. The unearthing of the Kipper came at a very exciting time in terms of paleontology. The term Dinosauria had only been named relatively recently by Sir Richard Owen in 1842, just nine years before the creature was discovered. In fact, some of the most well-known prehistoric species, such as Stegosaurus and Triceratops, would not be discovered until Othmill Marsh and Edward Cope fought the Great Fossil Rush, or Bone Wars, which lasted from 1877 till 1892, making the kipper much older in terms of discovery than more famous species. The skeleton itself is mounted in Leicester City's Newark Museum. The scale of the creature is absolutely magnificent, and one gets a definite feel for what such a creature must have been like in life. Indeed, it is easy to think of the great Leviathan, a fearsome sea monster described in the Bible, when looking upon the remains of the Barrow Kipper. Who dares open his mouth, ringed about with his fearsome teeth? His back has rows of shields tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between. They are joined fast to one another, they cling together and cannot be parted. Yet defining the kipper has proved to be something of a challenge. Although the description of the monster, as immortalised in Job 41, offers a tantalising image of something that could be likened to a prehistoric reptile, definitively classifying the animal has been the source of much uncertainty for years. Generally speaking, plesiosaurs typically fall into two different morphotypes, or forms. Firstly, there are the plesiosauromorphs, typical of the superfamily, plesiosauroidea, distinguishable by their small heads and long necks. This morphotype holds true for most plesiosauroidea, including plesiosaurus, microclidus, and elasmosaurus especially. Secondly, are the pleosauromorphs, which are somewhat opposite to plesiosauromorphs in that they generally have very short necks but huge heads as is the case with such Pleosauroidea as Cronosaurus and Liplorodon. However, the Barrowkipper is distinct in that it holds traits of both morphotypes, as pointed out by academics such as Adam Smith and Dr Frank O'Keefe. In the case of the Kipper, we are faced with a distinct morphotype in possession of a large head and a long neck. So where does the animal belong? Presently, the Barrowkipper belongs to a group of Pleosaurs called Romaliosaurs. Romaliosaurus megacephalus to be precise, but upon its discovery 160 years ago, it was classified as Plesiosaurus megacephalus, an entirely different family altogether. However, this has been disputed even further by various parties, including academics such as Smith, who suggest that the fossil actually belongs to the Euroclidus family, and Benson and Ketchum, who form an argument that leans towards the kipper being a new species altogether. The trouble with defining the animal is not purely based in its mixed morphology. The first fossil used to describe the species, or the holotype, 
was destroyed in an air raid during the Second World War, leaving behind little more than old photographs and partial casts. The kipper is now the neotype, or replacement example, for a species that it may not even belong to. Thanks to modern technology though, we can at least take a glimpse at what this animal might have looked like in life. To help paint a picture of what the kipper might have been like in life and understand exactly what the kipper was, I spoke to Newark Museum curator and plesiosaur expert, Mark Evans. Could you perhaps describe for us just how different prehistoric Leicestershire was to modern times? Well, prehistoric Leicestershire was um, different in lots of different ways, but the main thing to think about it is that prehistoric Leicester is not just one place. Um, I mean, we know about Leicestershire from um, a period about 550 million years ago when it was the bottom of a seabed at the foot of some old undersea volcanoes and very strange life forms living there. Uh, if you fast forward perhaps to the Jurassic times where some of these animals around us would have lived, then um, in the early bit of the Jurassic period it was uh, sort of shallow tropical sea. Amongst the inhabitants of prehistoric Leicestershire was the Barrow Kipper. What exactly was this creature? Well, the Barrow Kipper uh, is a, an animal called a plesiosaur. Um, and the plesiosaurs are a group of um, aquatic reptiles, we call them marine reptiles, although some did live in fresh water. Um, and the main things about them is that they had um, four flippers um, and a sort of longish neck. Um, and as far as you know, they're all um, predatory, so they all eat other, other animals or, or scavenge carcasses, things like that. Academics such as Benson and Ketchum have produced arguments suggesting that Romaliosaurus megacephalus should be classed as a new genus. How far do you agree with their proposal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you do the analysis of these animals, um, the animal behind us, the, uh, the Barra Kipper, um, we, we include this as its own, on its own basis, if you like, because um, A, there's a question mark as to what genus it belongs to, but actually the species is a little bit suspect as well, um, because the original specimen of what was then called Plesiosaurus megacephalus was destroyed in the war during bombing in, in Bristol. Um, and so there are differences between this specimen behind us and the Bristol specimen in a way, so it's probably not exactly the same species. Um, but when you plot out um, how similar these animals are to each other, um, Mammaliosaurus itself is a genus of um, plesiosaurs, which are rather larger than this, a um, bit more robust, um, different features in the skull of skeleton. Uh, and they're still lower Jurassic, but they're later in the lower Jurassic, so they're from a period we call the Tuarcian, which is around about um, 180, 175 million years ago, uh, whereas the animal here behind us is from the very, very bottom of the Jurassic period. Uh, so it's the earliest, one of the earliest Jurassic plesiosaurs, and it's about 199 million years old. So it's rather older. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Mark. It's thank you. Right. So it seems that the debate surrounding the classification of the kipper continues on just as the presence of the creature continues to have an effect on the look of the village today. Over the years, the reptile has steadily become part of the village's identity, an icon that has been taken up all over the village, from the big to the small. If you look into the history of the village, you might also discover some links to the kipper in unusual places, such as here at the Hammer and Pincers which is named after the quarrying industry that unearthed the fossil. Across the road, however, is a more obvious example of the kipper effect. Set into the very floor is a collection of six bronze shells, designed by Emma Evans, which are meant to represent a number of types of fossilised sea life. These shells are only one part of a larger experience, though, which make up one-tenth of a village activity known as the Fossil Trail. A map-guided walk through part of barrow upon -Saw dotted with sculptures of various prehistoric creatures. Sadly, one of the sculptures was destroyed in 2008 when a car crashed into the wall upon which it was mounted, but the piece has since been restored. The majority of the trail still remains untouched, such as this ammonite by Connell McCabe and a dragonfly suspended in amber by Sarah Spence. A pleasant sight for anyone who lives in or visits the village. Some pieces such as the skeletal relief by Jamie Frost, have a very obvious prehistoric subject matter, whereas others are left to interpretation, like Glenn Webb's organic forms. But whether abstract or realistic, every piece of the fossil trail serves as a testament to the paleontological history of Barra Ponsor, 
and the prehistoric monster that somewhat defines the village. It might come as a surprise to discover that this plaque is not part of the trail itself. It was instead created to celebrate both the discovery of the fossil itself and the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. However, it often becomes an unofficial yet fitting 11th piece of the fossil trail, being the final stop on the tour. So it seems that Barraponsaur has taken on the image of the Pliosaur as part of an adoption that began in 1851 and has grown from strength to strength ever since. Who knows when the kipper will finally earn a definitive name and join its true species, but one thing is certain. This much-loved resident of Barraponsaur will continue to be cherished as it shapes its surroundings for generations to come.